Hi guys, we're back. It's Shadowlands time. Shadowlands 5, but first I'm going to pick up all these other jobs. On to Sheng and Josephine. Hi Underdog, I think I can add a little context to that thing between Auntie and Josephine Tang, you know, the thing that makes Auntie hit the source and take revenge. This is a combo of stuff I heard and stuff I put together myself. Same mileage, my very. For years, the Yellow Lotus acted as tax co as tax collectors within the Walled City. Since the Walled City was built by Josephine Sang, the Yellow Lotus was run by Auntie Sheng. They were working. They had a working business relationship for a while, at least. From what Nightjar told me, he was a favourite. You got that right. Ayn was known as a real up and comer back then. She was on the fast track up to the next Yellow Lotus 438. That's a big deal gig, underdog. Money and power galore. Now you need to know that there were a lot of triads and corps doing biz in the walled city. All sorts of stuff. Sometimes they work together nicely and sometimes people get bloody. The way I heard it, Auntie came up with some sort of grand plan to consol consolidate power within the walled city. The power would be split between the Yellow Lotus and Sang's company and everyone else would get, a cut out, would get cut out. If the plan worked, Auntie would rise in the Lotus like nobody's business, and Josephine Sang would make Long Bank. There was a catch, though. In order for her plan to work, both women would need to jump through a lot of hoops. There'd be street-level manoeuvring and power plays on Auntie's side, and blackmail and negotiations on the corporate level from Josephine Sang. My information gets sketchy here, but from what I pieced together, Sang went behind Auntie's back and took a plan to a boss, a 4 3 eight named Long L Wong Lun Fass. They cut kindly out of her own plan. Why'd Sang do that? My guess is she saw Auntie as some kind of threat. People in the notes said that Wang Long Fat is weak and greedy. She can, she can be manipulated if her plan remains well greased. Long story short, power was consolidated in the Wall City, just like Auntie planned. Only she didn't wind up getting any of it. She climbed up the lotus ladder, came to an abrupt halt. She's still a straw sandal, just like she was before Sang's backstab Sang backstabbed her. Now she's stuck in Hioi like a fly in amber. I'd be pissed too if that were me. Urgent problem. We have problem solved. It's urgent. Meet me at the Mahjong parlor. Kindly or kindly's orders. A strangler bow. Out of town. I'm not in Hiaui right now. He I still don't know. Don't bother continue. So don't bother coming see me. We'll talk when I return. Please continue with our business ventures in the meantime. Day of retrieval. Hope you've enjoyed your newfound success in the shadows. I've got another job for you, one that should prove very lucrative indeed. I've been contacted by the employee of Eastern Tiger Corporation. He needs you to steal some research data and biological samples from his employer. The man's name is Tigath Wright. Till recently, he was a researcher on a genetic engineering project. He was cagey with the details, but I gather that it was centred around phenotop—I don't know—phenotopic alteration and postnatal genetic enhancement. Fortunately for Wright, he got a conscience, stupid man. Luckily for us, he's willing to pay to have his conscience assuaged. Wright's project was apparently quite horrible. Experiments on living children, total disregard for biomedical ethics or safety. And when Wright raised concerns, he was taken off the project. He's decided to step outside the bounds of the law and expose their wrongdoing to the world. The snag you see is that his wife and child live in Seoul. Not quite the heart of the Eastern Tiger's power, but close enough. He's afraid that if he releases the information himself, they'll be taken prisoner and used as leverage. The idiot should have thought of that before, that, before, but that's not our problem. The samples and data are currently on an Eastern Tiger cargo ship, the MV Nalchi, sa uh, sailing near Hong Kong on the way to Seoul. The storm slowed the ship down, so you won't have long, you, so you don't have to go right away, but don't take too long. Once you have the data samples, you're to call right. And I've attached his number. He'll give you instructions on what he wants the information leaked. When you're ready, let me know. I'll arrange transit with Captain Jomo. He's a local Loho Joa pirate and smuggler, but don't let that put you off. He's as good as they get, and he'll have you on that ship without an incident. And take that run. I'll let Captain Jomo know you're ready. You can find him on down at the end of the pier my parlour is on. He'll handle everything from there on out. Sweet. Um, no, I'm going to talk to people. Uh, let's go to the top and work our way down. Uh, 
Hello, Gobbit. It is time for my Shadowrun lesson. Okay, she's got some food. You know the Kraken has already been shaping up over the past few days. With all the work that we put, it, we've been putting into her, she's starting to feel like a real home. Anyway, enough about the boat. Ready for your next lesson, or did you just want to chat? I'm ready for my next lesson. Yeah, that's good. I was hoping you'd want to keep going with this. It's good for you, and I'm kind of enjoying it too. Uh, sorting out her hair. All right, this is going to be another long story, so I'm thinking we should take it in chunks. If you've got any questions, you can ask them along the way. If you need to take a break, or we can come back to it. Sound good? Hey, if you want to do this, fine by me. Good. So last time I told you about the event that brought an end to my illustrious career as a subcontractor. This time I'm going to tell you about a run that I went on with my regular team. Was this where you started running with Isabel? No, that was a long time before Iz hit the streets up as a runner. We were friends and everything, but she was still learning to debt back then. She was good for her age, but she wasn't ready for prime time. You know anyone from the group that I'm talk You don't know anyone from the group that I'm talking about. They're all gone now anyway. Had a rough career, haven't you? Yeah, I guess I have, but I'm still alive. That's something. Puts me ahead of a lot of other runners I've known. The truth of the matter is, runners, as runners, dying on the job is an occupational hazard. We're disposable assets. It shouldn't come as a surprise that we get used up and tossed away. Uh, it's the same way in the Barrens here today, gone tomorrow. Yeah, you know how it is. People die and it's sad, but there's no sense moping about it. Tell me about the team that you were running with. Sure. Amosa was a Hawaiian Jew with poor impulse control. Big round guy with lumberjack arms and ringlets in his hair. He called himself Honu. I guess that he loved turtles? I don't know. Street names are weird. But a tech specialist, Egris. She was tall, gawky, dyed her hair bone white. She has a drone named Arlo and that followed her around like a lost puppy. She was kind of a jack of all trades, but she could get the job done. Fun at parties, too. A de facto team leader was a guy named Sweet. Sweet? I don't know. He was a wiry troll, if you could imagine that. Probably about 2% body fat, all skin and bones. What would the hunch to make himself look smaller? He was a shaman, followed rat like me. There can't be many rat troll rat shamans out there. Not that I've met, but Sweet seemed like a pretty good guy. We got along fine. I actually liked everyone on the team. They were a lot of fun to run with. How did you meet the group? Very mutual friends. We all lived together before we decided to start running as a team. There's a floating there was uh, this floating squatters commune out in Hung Hom Hung Hom Bay. It's probably still out there actually. I haven't been back in a long time, but I spent a few years living on the thing, and the rest of the team lived there with me. Squatters commune? Yep, we called it the sinking ship. It was an enormous raft all bolted together from old shipping containers. It wasn't the most comfortable place I've ever lived, but the price was right and the company was good. Okay, I got a grasp. Alright, moving on. So one day, Swede brought up a job. He met a client in Victoria Harbour Bar. A rich eastern target exec. The guy wanted us to steal something for him. A shiny object. I know, I know, it's stupid, right? But that's how the Johnson described it to us, the shiny object. That's what he wanted us to guess. He never gave it any other name. Seriously, a rat shaman hides sh to steal a shiny object? Yeah, you can see how the gig would be hard for us to resist. Anyway, the client told us what to look for. He described it as a chunk of red jade about the size and shape of an ostrich egg, with a mirror polished surface and gold wire in layers. He said that it would have paper charms hanging off it, food talismans, tarot sorcery stuff. We weren't supposed to touch those. The client also told us that the shiny, shiny object's then owner, an old hedge wizard turned entre entrepreneur named Kong Xian. Hedge wizard? Had this whole wise old sage thing going on. He had the robes, the little hat, the kind smile, and the piece to the piece of resistance, a long wispy beard. He was a mean he was mean as a snake though, had a rep to prove it. Intel said the old man Zion was keeping the shiny object in one of his warehouses. He had a bunch of them. He built a nice little empire selling magical paraphernalia through puppet vendors in the Yamati night market. Supposedly a good fifth of the stores in that place were on Zion's payroll. Got it. So he cast the warehouse for a couple of nights before the run, you know, did some recon, took some notes. From what we'd seen, we were pretty sure that Zion was keeping our payday in a vault area at the very back of the building. Security was pretty heavy though. He was paying a, lock of, a local trial for protection and he kept a lot of their boys and stuff. Swede was the one who came up with the plan. We'd split up outside and enter the warehouse in two teams. 
Team A would create a diversion. Team B would hit the vault with security was looking the other way. We'd grab our payday, regroup and get the hell out of there. Splitting the group is always never split the party. I'd agree with you if we are going in expecting a straight fight, but as shadow runner, you should almost never aim to get into one of those. When you're on the job, you've always got to be outnumbered and outgunned. Going quiet is inherently safer than going in loud, and if splitting the group is what it takes to do that. Anyway, team A, Hanu and Egret circled around the loading dock, just like we planned. So we and I waited at the serv uh, service entrance. We didn't have to wait long. A couple of minutes in, we heard this ungodly crash, then another, and another. Turns out, Egret had rigged Xeon's network of automated forklifts. She had six of them running amok in the loading bay. Chasing down the workers and crashing themselves into everything marked fragile. D subtle. It wasn't supposed to be subtle. She was making a distraction, remember? Honestly, underdog, you need to stop paying attention. Anyway, Egret's distraction did what it was supposed to, as Swe and I watched most of our tri guys at the service entrance abandon their posts and went hauling off after the loading dock. A couple of guys with baseball bats stayed behind, but we handled them easily enough. We slipped inside and made a beeline for the back of the warehouse, where the shiny object was supposed to be. Uh, and did you find it there? Yeah, actually it was there. Just like we thought it'd be. The door was open and everything. The, si the shiny object was sitting in a teak cradle, gleaming with reflected light, just like the client had said. It had a ring of Taoist talismans hanging out of it, like a uh, grass skirt. The paper all crinkled with age. We didn't waste any time. I reached in and grabbed the thing. It felt strange through my glove. The judge sort of uh, pulsed, as if it had a heartbeat. That sounds ominous. Yeah, tell me about it. I wanted to drop the thing, but it was our payday, so I slipped it into my satchel and, uh, instead. I couldn't get the flap closed quickly enough. The package being secure, Swee and I turned to tile it out there, then things went to shit. Did the shiny object do something unpredictable? No, not the shiny object, old man Zion. He was standing there, right in front of us, larger than life. I'm guessing that he heard the commotion in the loading dock, he'd come running well, waddling to make sure that his treasure was safe. It turned out it wasn't because I'd already sold him the thing. He looked displeased. What did you do? What do you think we did? We had our bats to a wall. We lit the old bastard up. It was pretty epic, truth be told. Spirits were summoned, spells were discharged, the vault door sealed behind Zion like something out of a movie. At one point the old man leapt onto Swee's back and tried to bite his ear off. I won't bore you with the play-by-play -play of how the fight went down. In the end we crushed him. Fortunately the fighting had caused some collateral damage. At some point during our sh showdown with Xeon, the control panel for the vault door must have uh, eaten an arc of lightning or a blast of a powerball. It was toast or black and melted, and neither of us could fix it. So you're trapped in the vault? Yeah, that's about the size of it. And it was only a matter of time before the old man's remaining security guards found us there. There was still one way out. A ventilation duct up high in the rafters, but it was too small for Swede to fit through. He was droll, after all. I had the shiny object, but if I left Swede there and security got him, well, you do the math. So here's a conundrum. I've got our payday in my satchel. The team is split. It's inevitable that more triad 49ers are going to find us, but we don't know when or how many. Igret and Hyun are holding their own in the loading dock for now. I can say we're sweet to help fight off the inevitable wave of triad 49ers, but we'll be badly outmatched, like badly. The odds of survival won't look good for either of us. If Igret wasn't pinned down the loading dock, she probably could have got the vault door open, but in order to get her, I'd have to leave Sui alone in the vault. Sion's reinforcements find Sweet before I got back with Egret well. So uh, that's the scenario, Underdog. Not a lot to work with, I know. Now tell me, what should I do? I think I tried to use the artifact. That's the most stylish answer, isn't it? Just audacious enough to be fun. It popped into my head right there, same as it did yours. So that's what I did. No hesitation. I just made it happen. It was almost like Swee had been waiting for me to p pass him the thing. He seemed eager to take it. He hugged that chunk of rock close to his chest like a newborn baby. Colours sw swam in the stone. Something changed in his eyes. Then old man Zeon's 49ers breached the door and Swee unleashed hell. What went down in that room? Well, I've only seen that kind of carnage of a couple of times in my life, and I've been running the shadows for years. Those tribe men were torn to scraps by the end of it. Don't think I'll ever forget the sounds that they made. I uh, spent most of the fight huddled up in the corner for my own safety. When C let loose th from the stone, didn't seem terribly interested in discriminating between friend and foe. Uh, did he? Did he summon a spirit? 
something like that. Truth be told, I don't know what they were. Like I said, I was hiding, but he could have done it without the shiny object. Not in a mil He couldn't have done it, rather. Not in a million years. Whatever they were, the rock brought them here. So what happened then? We wait for the things to calm down in the vault, and when things... And for the things to go slithering away. I think we had some limited control over them, which is why they didn't eat us. After they were gone, Swee gave me the shiny object back, I put it in my satchel, and we bailed. We collected the others on the way out. They were blissfully ignorant of what happened on the other side of the warehouse, and I didn't see a reason to change that. We hardtailed it back to the docks and caught the first boat back on the sinking ship mission accomplished. From what I'm told, people still avoid Zion's warehouse like the plague. It's supposed to be haunted even to this day. People who set foot in the building keep turning up dead. Pretty sure I'm the only living person who knows why. Anyway, that's lesson over. If you've got any questions, go ahead. No, but what was the point in the story? I'm trying to find a moral here. There was wet. There was when I started telling it. I thought I was going to tell you to be comfortable with breaking the rules. I don't think I'm going to say that now. I'm not feeling it anymore. Why not? At least you didn't made it out of the run alive. They didn't stay that way for long. But let's leave that for next time, huh? I don't want to get into it just now. Let's take a break. Of course, like I said, it's a long story. So was there something else you wanted to talk about? Thoughts on that last run? I think that went pretty well. There aren't a lot of runners who can say they went up against Ares and came out ahead. Sure, maybe the job could have gone a little smoother, but how were we supposed to account for another runner team showing up? Adaptability, underdog, that's what makes a good runner. Always go with your instincts. Feel bad that we didn't give those runners Liza. I mean, at all, I was like, oh hell no. I want an awesome Liza, but now that I'm not so sure. They seem like decent people, and maybe they could have helped us out later. Still, we have got a sweet laser out of the deal. Pew pew. I'm so going to sell that laser. It's worth 2,000 gold. 2,000 uh, new yen. Um, that's it for now. Peace. Ah, uh, Isabel, do you have anything interesting to say? Are you in the Matrix? You are. Need something? I'm busy. How did you lose your childhood memories? I'd rather not go into it. It's personal. So if I say I've never missed them, at least not until now. If you ever want to talk to it, talk about it, I'm a good listener. Great, I'll keep that in mind. Sure, drop by any time. Shut up, Isabel. Duncan, now leave me alone, I've got stuff to think about. Do you ever think about when we kids? Um. Yeah, light would be good. Don't get me wrong, catching up is nice, but I'm not used to being a social as this. This is one of the reasons why it's so nice to work under Carter. Both appreciate long times. Navy Spice, thank God, bask in it. Oh, and good talk, Amelia. I'll catch up with you later. Bastard. Fuck you, I'm not talking to you anymore. I'm just going to talk to my reliable team. Raptor. Ah, my friend, you've done an admirable job. An admirable job indeed. I've already incorporated that technology that you recovered my stolen tech into a new chassis for that I'm fabricating for Corshi. Not that big a deal. We were going there anyway. As you say. The next time we go to the field, you can expect to find Corshi's combat effectiveness considerably improved. He has become truly deathless, just as his namesake was in the Legends. When he takes damage, he will mend himself before your eyes. Sounds incredible. Can't wait to see it. Nor can I, my friend. Nor can I. Got you. Hello, underdog. Pardon me for continuing my exercise. I feel that I have let them slip as of late. Don't you ever stop practicing? No. I feel like there's no point to read this. I think no just says it all. Uh, I aim to achieve perfection, and I must work against my current handicap to regain the level of control that I once possessed. I'm stronger and faster than I once was, but I need to learn to use my new senses more effectively in order to 
bring those advantages to bear. See that edge, forged by one of the finest swordsmiths in modern Japan. Diamond coated edge, capable of cutting even the most hardened ceramic armors. But what good is sharpened edge without the precision to apply it? When I was still a man, I could have cut a single pea in half with my eyes closed. Oddly, after becoming blind, I cannot replicate this feat. I think soon I will be able to perform this feat again. I'll simply have to train my body to ignore the senses that it no longer has. Pay attention to the new ones. Now, what is it you would like to discuss? Any thoughts about the last run? A good run, I think. Unexpected complications, perhaps, but I'm told we were quite successful. But all told, I, we were quite... With any luck, the Red Dragon will be paid a visit by Night Errant Security, and soon, despite the other team, we sowed enough chaos that I doubt Ares will realise our deception. What's more, we managed to acquire a powerful and unique weapon. While a single weapon is unlikely to give us an overwhelming advantage, I will gladly take any edge I can on future runs. Few would expect a team of Shadow Runners to be so well equipped as to have an experimental high energy laser. Is there anything else I can do for you? Uh, was it difficult to fight blind? It's not the easiest thing I've attempted, but neither is it the hardest. Emptiness is form. It's one of the great lessons of Hagakuri. Train sufficiently, and both swordsmanship and obedience will come instinctively. That is close to perform uh, perfection a man can attain. Does that mean in a perfect world you would have killed yourself when you got infected? If an order should be unjust or foolish, it should not be followed. To waste a skilled warrior, as they would have by killing me, it is unacceptable. Obedience with that thought is to be cultivated, but so is moral fortitude to know when to disagree. When I was new to the unit, I thought to be—I thought that to be a good samurai was the ultimate goal. That to serve justly was, with dedication, was the greatest honor a warrior could have. We were all young and foolish once, I suppose. So I changed my mind. Beyond my disease, there was a fight in Fukuoka. My former team ambushed me. It had a singular effect on my worldview. We were taught that, that we were superior to everyone, that since we were pure humans and Japanese, we would always win. I believe that most never questioned the valid validity of this claim, even when confronted with direct evidence to the contrary. Tell me about when your old unit ambushed you. Uh. Very well. My time in Fukuoka was tense. Since leaving Kianshin, I've been careful to stay outside by moving on foot or in the back of automated delivery vans. I was running out of food, however, and need to be in a seat for that. Fukuoka is just big enough to get lost in, but not so large that a ghoul sighting could go unnoticed. I hid in abandoned buildings with storm drainage systems, and for two weeks I managed to stay hidden. The strain of having to constantly move was wearing on me, however. I made a mistake. I had to get out of Japan, but all my contacts in Fukuoka had come up empty-handed when I asked for a way to China. I was running low on money, and I could feel the team catching up with me. A contact of mine in Kumamoto owed me a favour and arranged passage for me that I could reach the city in 48 hours. If I had taken my time, I could have made it to Kumamoto without incident, but I let caution slip when I got his email. I thought that uh, if I disguised myself, I could take the train there, get out before my unit got any close to finding me. Still don't know how they found me. Magical tracking, perhaps, or simply a well-developed spy network. Regardless, they found me. They were waiting for me at Hakata Station. It was an ambush. That's a very public place for an ambush. It is. I suspect their orders were clear, however. Do whatever it takes to kill me. Civilians expendable. For units like the Red Samurai, ordinary laws do not apply. The mission's success is the only concern. I'd taken steps to disguise myself as the best I could, relying on the sheer numbers of, sheer numbers of people to conceal my presence. I suspected the team might attack while I was in public, but I did not realise just how expendable the civilians were. When they blew the C4 charges over the station's western entrance just to box me in, I realised how much I underestimated them. I assumed that a train had derailed, honestly, but then I smelled the telltale acrid vapour of the explosives. Once you smell it, you'll never forget. The plastic explosive that we used with a particularly sharp odour, like old cheese. Something to do with the olfactory ta uh, tangents added to help track it if it was stolen. I remember stumbling through the dust and debris trying to find my way to the rail platforms. They attacked from all sides, using confusion to strike at once. I could hear Ishida and Takagawara behind me. Amori and Sasaki charged out from the access corridor just ahead of where I'd been standing. 
Saki threw a fireball down behind me, couldn't have him have a retreat while our Amori started firing. Sounds like you didn't have much chance to choice but to defend yourself. Yes, that is so. Training took over. I knew I had to survive, and I was not thinking of anything but survival. So I charged Sasaki and Amori. They were only 15 metres away from me. The, the only advantage I had was that they were as blind by the dust as I was, but I could still hear and smell them. Saki threw a lightning bolt at me, but I managed to roll under it. I came up. Amori's light machine gun was swivelling down. Felt time stretch out as I stared down the barrel. Caught Amori in the throat with the tip of my sword. It was a manoeuvre I practised hundreds of times before. There was no resistance as I cut through his trachea, and he fell as I rolled to the side. I could hear him choking for breath as he dropped. He's trying to think how clear that memory is, even now. When the adrenaline is pumping, you form memories with more clarity. Certainly that is true, but I remember the strike so clearly for an entirely different reason. It was a strike that I realised who I truly was. But did it mean that I, an infected monster that was less than a beast, could still defeat the finest soldiers in the world? Red Samurai Doctrine taught Amori and the others not to fear me, and this overconfidence would be their death. I realised I had progressed beyond the ability to understand. My sword was so ac was accurate as ever, but they could not account for it due to the ideological blindness. Other units wouldn't have made that mistake. Perhaps not. But that's what... But that is what I mean. Renraku told us so often of our excellence, yet also taught us to discount the strength and cunning of non-humans. I could no longer define myself by my association with them, as it was apparent that I had surpassed them. This was not a mistake I would have made. Saki was the next to fall. As I turned away from Mamori, I realised she must have seen me strike him. Her eyes were wide. I could feel her fear and anger as she tried to summon another spell. She seemed caught between healing Amori and attacking me. It was there on Saki... Uh, Gaiju tapped his forehead just above the right eye. It was there on Saki, a damaged stroke from the Joden stance. She was, he she had hesitated just as Amori had. Felt the breath go out of her, like someone had deflated a tyre. She just slid down in a pile. I think she's tried to ask me how when I ran. What about Yoshida and Takagwara? My goal was to survive, not victory. Takagwara was too far away and I did not see Yoshida. Only smelled him, so I ran. The trans had been shut down due to the explosion, but as long as I could get out of Hataka station, I knew I could escape. They did not follow me out of the seat proper. From what I heard by the Matrix, the event was reported as a terrorist attack that was thwarted by brave Enraku soldiers. Brave, foolish soldiers. If you killed two of them, why are they still hunting you? I am unsure what the, why that would have made a difference. Can you explain what you were driving at? The unit's down three members, why not give up on you? I see. I think your mistake is seeing it for this from a practical perspective. The problem is emotional, not mechanical. The nature of Red Samurai assignments is that losses are generally zero, or the entire team. In those rare cases when Red Samurai teams suffer partial losses, the remnants of the impacted teams are sh shuffled together and undergo retraining. Saki and Amori will undoubtedly be replaced. The problem is that I cannot be replaced. Simply put, I'm not dead. Originally, a missing Red Samurai would be considered dead for purposes of reorganising the team, but Renraku knows precisely what happened to me. What's more, my failure to do my duty reflects badly on the unit. Others will undoubtedly resist joining my former squad, as it has been tainted. So until they kill you, nobody wants to join their club? Yes, that is the case. They cannot move forward and rebuild the core of the unit unless I die, both because of their own expectations and the stain on their honour. Even if they accepted my decision, the rest of the Red Samurai would not. They have hunted me in Japan, Shanghai and Beijing. Now I'm certain they will hunt me here in Hong Kong. The cycle will continue endlessly for the foreseeable future. Such is the way of things. You sound as trapped in the past as they are. What do you mean by that? They've been hunting me. I'm simply trying to make a new life for myself. I fail to see how that is my doing. Take the fight to them. What do you suggest? That I hunt them down while they sleep and murder them in cold blood? You define yourself by your opposition to your old life. What? I'm unsure that I clearly understand your meaning. Could you explain yourself more clearly? Think about it. You get to live on the, as the running red samurai. I'm fairly cast out by his unit. Ah. And you believe that absent like... 
absent that opposition, I would have little to defy myself. That is very cheap philosophy, underdog, and unworthy of you. What have you accomplished other than simply surviving? You tell me, what do you see? I'm a creature that stands in front of you, that is what I am, in your opinion. Shadow runner, just like the rest of us. I suppose that is facet of who I am, yes. I sell my services for money, and they're particularly niche nature. Why then do you insist that I am trapped in the past? In this business you either cut off an enemy's ability to hurt you or you get killed. I can understand that line of reasoning, yes. But by the same token, if an enemy is an overwhelming threat, you are always certain to retreat. Some fights cannot, should not be fought in the open. I seek to perfect myself, my skills and my abilities in combat. Perhaps this is not the path I would have walked when I was younger. I would have been a soldier for so long that I cannot imagine devoting myself to any other trade. This does not mean I am tied inex inextricably to my unit. It simply means that I am shaped by my history, as are we all. I appreciate your concerns about my history and my unit, but I assure you I am doing all right. I must learn to adapt to my new condition and lifestyle on my own. The time will come when they find me in Hong Kong. So what will you do when you unit when they come looking for you in Hong Kong? I'm unsure. You've given me a great deal to consider, and I do not mean that lightly. There are several actions and possible outcomes I can foresee. I could, as have before, relocate to another city, flee Hong Kong, travel to somewhere further afield. Lagos, perhaps, or Montreal. It would have to be some place where Benraku's influence was minimal, and the unit's presence would be immediately noticeable. That has been my plan of action in the past. I could also keep a low profile staying here, hope they are unable to find precisely where I am hiding. Undoubtedly Ishida would command the team to keep looking. I believe it would only be a matter of time before they found me, but if they were a sufficiently long time, they might be recalled. I could also confront them, draw them out into the open at a time and place of my choosing. They are nothing if not predictable in their efforts to follow Red Samurai operational doctrine. The plan w could succeed, but it could also put you and civilians at risk, and I am unsure how I would draw them out in the first place. need to find a way to fight them. I'm unsure if that is a wise course of action. I'm going to need to think about this a great deal. Please let me think of this. I will have an answer later. Sure. I feel that might be a mission for him to go kill his buddies. Uh, access to Shadowlands VBS. Stuff installed offshore. Update on Siphon Usagi. Inf Infrared images of the storm's eye to wall transitions are really quite stunning, by the way. I don't care, newscaster. Look, babe, I just made the cartoonified typhoon for you. It's got a little purse and sparkles and bubble tea. Night arms with assorted weapons and a necklace of skulls and everything. You're the best. The J-pop theme on the ammunition belts really takes it over the top of a Manita. You're a special person. Sang Mechanical Service is a rising star. Has anyone else been keeping track of the Executive Council elections? It's almost time for the latest round. The competition is heating up. Up until this point, Tantian Kitsio Sao Kok Chu looked like the best pick to replace Josephine Sang of Sang Mechanical Services, despite what's in CEO Kent Zuling's rivalry with Chu. He had the support of both Yang Lim Fa of Shibasa, Shiba, Shibasa and Adrian Chung of Hildebrandt Clinfoot Bernal. Now, though, I'm not so sure. Josephine Sang seems pretty confident that she'll remain on the council. From what I've heard, she's cut a deal with Ares Asia, Manobi, and Eastern Tiger to stay out of their way. In exchange, I'll let her Southeast Asia large corporation construction, large scale construction projects. A cozy relationship like this could turn the tides against Tan Tian. Um, sure. What a not load of crap. Maybe crap, but people in. Don Guan ate it up. The idea of signing with a local company isn't that isn't Beihou, and believe me, they count Tan Tian and Wuxing as foreign. It's far too much a draw for them to pass on. I'm thinking the absent catastrophe, Josephine Tang will be on the executive council in the next few days. Why do they count Wuxing as foreign? Tan Tian, sure, they're headquartered in Beijing, but Wuxing's just as native to Hong Kong as Sang, as Sang is. Wuxing and Canton Confederation have been at odds since 2015. That, that's just you. 
Pussy made a habit of exploiting the people of Guangdong and using loopholes to shield themselves from taxation. What's more, Boxing has a primary move in the f founding the Free Enterprise Zone, permanently stopping the Confederation's designs on Hong Kong. Sang took a different tactic. Josephine Sang started out promising Canton Confederation as a lucrative taxation agreement in exchange for a low-cost, long-term lease for their facilities in Dongguan. She was sweetened the deal by treating them like family rather than adversaries. She's got the meeting out of her hand. Punk metal hardcore. Got a collection of over 10,000 albums of punk hardcore, hardcore light, thrash, thrash metal, heavy metal, light metal, death metal, metal... Nuevo Sinopunk, Synthpunk, Cyberthrash, Synthcore, Hong Kong Scar, and triple umlaut bands like Umlaut. If there's an album you've been searching for, I might just have it in return in search of any weird obscure bands to add to my library. Let me know. If any Cyberscore Synth Metal, as for all my interest, you own the complete over of this German punk bank. Messerkampf! Heard of them? Messerkampf is uh, Dietrich's band from uh, Dragonfall. Messerkampf, haha, they're so mainstream. They're really big in JIS. Really? Do they tour? Nah, man, I don't think so. Those Berlin anarchist bands never survive very long. Besides, I think they broke up a really long time ago. They're probably aging wedge slides now. No idea that they're widely popular on the other side of the planet. Looking for Decker. Looking for an experienced Decker for a discreet milk room picking up a special access card of wedge slide. Potential for longer term arrangements. We're a team that's been together, blah blah blah. Requirements you do not take experimental sims during run. You must not tamper with chemicals in secret labs. You must have a good sense of humour. Knock knock. Uh. You said a good sense of humour. It's a joke, see? At this point, you were actually more interested in hiring an experienced professional with a mature adult's impulse control. We've had some bad luck with our deckers lately. The last two. The last one has left two feet and. Had two left feet and couldn't seem to stop t stumbling into containers full of volatile substances. Poor runs with scissors 2056. Although by looking at her name, I guess we should have known. So basically you guys are desperate for a decker. Has anyone else contacted you? Uh, we can wait a little longer. Meet me, you guys are starting to get a bad rap, you know. Jinxed. We're sunk, all of us. Swim. As some of you know, I have a keen interest in urban planning, geophysics, and anything involving our eventual and inevitable destruction. Pended in a recent summary of the rising sea level in Hong Kong, it expresses the issues well in lay terms. Freedom Cowboy. You can play my post titles are a bit sterile. How's this one? Oh, that's the title. Here's an article. Really don't care. So we're going to be running jobs from gondolas in 50 years, that's the message. When does one simply financial... When one does some simple financial modelling and extrapolates the worsening severity and frequency of super typhoons along with the geological outlook, the actual message is that it may be necessary to abandon Hong Kong. WP, I take it back. Keep your several titles. That's so endearing about you is that you talk about the grimmest things like an accountant. Double entry, a cruel... Accounting is an amazing system. If more operators took an interest in it, they would have done much better long-term financial security as well as be able to be interpret and manipulate materials encountered during their work. It's pretty ironic that your handle shortens to WP, normally associated with white phosphorus. Actually, Hatch, it's not. It's really not. White phosphorus is exceptionally useful, not merely because of its hypergolic igni ignition and the fact that once burning gets chemically immune to water quenching, but also because of its high adhesiveness, adhesion and biotoxicity. I don't take pleasure in those qualities, but I appreciate them. Okay. There we have it, Shadowlands, guys. Um, I'm going to do my uh, off-screen shopping. Might get some cyberware. Uh, might get some other stuff. And I'll catch you all on the flip side for our next Shadow Run. But first... Like me in real life. And take some rest. Stabbing pain in your stomach jolts you and also read this nightmare. Stabbing pain in your stomach jolts you awake. Your entire abdomen is cramping up. You're rolling your cup, willing the shooting pains that radiate from your stomach to go away. Your mouth is bone dry and your tongue is swollen. It feels in. It feels thickening. Articulate, like a useless slab of meat. 
quick glance at your PDA tells you that it's 4am outside of your cabin, the rest of Hue sleeps. All you remember of the dream is that you awoke from his terrible, unfilling yearning. We need to get where you were going first. Others were behind you. You could feel the heat of the breath on your neck. If you were to beat them to the destination, you could slam the door in their faces, keep them out and get you away from and keep them out and away from what's yours. But if they overtook you, you would feel terrible longing forever. As you grasp of your last as you grasp at the last fleeting memories of the dream, a wave of exhaustion washes over you. It feels like you've been drugged. He claps back onto the cot and into a black dream to sleep. When you open your eyes again, some filters under the door. It's morning. There we have it, guys. There we have it. Why can't I save again? Alright. I'll figure that out off screen. But for now, catch you guys on the flip side. Peace.